Hi, everybody. I'm Howard Newkrug. I'm the executive director of the Water Center at Penn. We've been around for about five years now. We're very, very, very excited about so many different things that we're doing. And, and I think this really shows the amount of work that we are starting to do with our corporate friends and, and neighbors and colleagues. And uh, uh, that's a pretty impressive list there. And so thank you. And if I just get from all the people here, an applause for <laughs> companies, the companies that are here. It's, it's, it's a very, very impressive uh, group of folks and uh, old friends and new friends and looking forward to working with you guys on the Water Center. Next slide. Which is, this is the Water Center. No, these are not our buildings, but it's, <laughs> it's not even our water. But uh, uh, our, our philosophy is really dealing with community and equity, science, resilience and justice very much. Uh, we're very urban. Urban can mean very small, rural urban, but we're very urban focused, water utility focused, community focused, and justice focused. And that's, uh, that's what's really important to us in just about every project that we do. And we're doing a bunch of projects we're not going to talk to you about today, but I'd uh, love to get you, get you all involved with that. Uh, Travis? Yep, there's Travis Loop, and, and Travis Travis is the guy behind the camera in uh, uh, a, a did I call it a company or what is what is what a nonprofit media outlet that's called Waterloop, and um, last I saw was like uh, um, 197. 199. Say, I can't. I can't keep up with you. 199 uh, 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 interviews with different people in the water business on all different subjects, and uh, he's really great. And he's here today because he wants to interview some of the students that, that are here or going to be here today, and uh, find out about their aspirations and how water is important to them, and how something like this could be really helpful. So, uh, without further ado, I'm just uh, I'm really up here to introduce. One of my favorite people, Mar uh, Maria Andrews, who's uh, uh, going to moderate this session for us and thank all the speakers and my uh, neighbor and, and good friend, Angela, yes, <laughs> and uh, who's going to be doing the keynote. Thank you. And um, uh, Maria is the assistant director of Earth and Environmental Science Undergraduate Studies whenever she has a, a, a student that's looking to major in environmental studies, environmental science, uh, she, she meets with them and then advises them on their programs. And if they have anything to do with water, she sends them my way. And I get to, I get to grab onto them too. So thank you so much for that. And, and, and one of our connections is my first child who's here, Joe. <laughs> Who, uh, <laughs> hey, Joe. <laughs> Who, when, when he was getting out of uh, undergraduate school, we were trying to figure out, he was trying, well, sorry, embarrassing you, but, <laughs> but trying to figure out what are you going to do? And, and most undergraduates don't really know where they're going to end up or what they're going to end up doing. And I, of course, was pushing water and Joe is resisting and he has resisted, but he's here with Bentley, which is and very much water related. I really appreciate that, Joe. And I, but anyway, Maria. Uh, was the person who really gave me a lot of ideas and gave Joe some ideas of what to do next, and so appreciate that. So without further ado, Maria, I'll stop putting my foot in my mouth and I'll get off the stage. <laughs> all right, well, thank you, Howard, for the kind introduction, and welcome all to the Water Center um, annual career. Um, in the water industry event. So we are in Philadelphia. Look outside. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful. So this is the best time to talk about water. So again, um, I am the, the, the associate director for the undergraduate program. So we do have the environmental studies major and the air science major. I also teach for the, pro, uh, for the program and I do many other things. But for students, I have been taking a few minutes to go around and talk to a lot of companies. They're all hiring, okay? So okay. you have come to the right place. So please take advantage to, to do that. Uh, as the major advisor for the department, I hear the interest of our students in important water issues, such as water infrastructure, that ensures the protection of water quality and delivers sustainable 
and equitable water to communities. So this will be, again, a great opportunity for you, all of you as students and people that are interested in water issues to communicate and have a great conversations with leaders in the water industry. So talking about leaders in the water industry, uh, I would like to introduce our opening keynote speaker, Angela Curie. Angela is the Vice President, Chief Compliance Officer and Head of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion for Benley Systems, the infra infrastructure engineering software company. Benley System provides innovative software to advance the world's infrastructure, sustaining both the global economy and environment. Angela is responsible for managing the company's regulatory compliance and, co and corporate responsibility programs. So let's welcome Angela to the stage. Thank you. How you doing, Penn Water Center? Let me tell you how I'm doing. I went to game seven of the Phillies playoff series and I'm exhausted, but I was just talking to Howard. I'm actually kind of glad that I can catch up on sleep now because being in the playoffs and being a Phillies fan is really tiresome. And of course, our hearts were broken, but I am so happy to be here at the Water Center today. It's our, my second appearance. We were here last year and we were not prepared, but we are so prepared this year. We've got Way, our recruiter, to gauge interest from anyone here who is looking for a job at Bentley. And I will go through the ecosystem of water and what it specifically looks like at Bentley later on. But we are here to talk about, uh, let's see, the matter of water and equity and access, because that's what it's really about. We're here to pipeline talent to design, build, operate, and maintain smart and resilient water systems that provide clean and reliable water to everybody on this planet. This day serves as the catalyst to find our next world problem solvers and doers. And you know that's a really tall order, but the statistics are pretty alarming. Just in our backyard, who's been around in Philly for more than a year? Do you remember that water, that water alert last spring with the chemical spill in the Delaware River? I remember it really well because I was at a five-year-old birthday party and I was literally sitting there like this. Do I go to CVS and go get water? Oh my God, are like the shelves empty? What am I gonna do? How are we gonna drink water? It was a really defining moment for me and my family. We have never had water insecurity in Philadelphia. And then on the heels of that, just a couple of months later, was a no boil alert. I did not even know what that meant, but it meant that there was a problem with wastewater in our water system. So honestly, like I said, up to this point, I had never thought about access and equity to clean water other than somewhere other than in my backyard. But it touched my daily life, it touched my family's life, and I thought, you know, what are we gonna do about it? And I submit to you that I am not a water expert. I'm here because of two informative events in my life. In 1977, I was born in a small town in South Korea to two school teachers. Exactly 30 years later, I moved three doors down from Howard Newkrug. <laughs> My family and I immigrated to the US when I was three years old in 1980. My life was not unlike many Asian American immigrants. I was given three career choices, doctor, lawyer, accountant. And I like the lawyer route. Lawyers seem to make a lot of money and dress smartly. So from the age of five, I knew I was going to law school. The next piece of this puzzle is cut 25 years from when I was five and I knew I was going to law school. I'm a young lawyer and my then fiance, now husband, Jeff Curry, and I moved to Howard Newkrug's block. <laughs> what happens between then and now is the product of hard work and seeking opportunities through social capital. And that's how me, a dime a dozen lawyer, I literally tell everybody, I just did law school. I went to a large law firm. I did whatever they told me to do. A dime a dozen lawyer enters and her way into the water industry. I spent the first half of my professional career doing the work. It was brutal. Being in a large law firm was brutal. I was slogging away 60 hour work weeks 
And I did this because I saw how hard my school teacher parents had to work in the US. They didn't speak English. Their vocation was education. My mom took a shift job at the post office and my dad was in a factory. And I said, you know what, I can get, I can get through this. But I always knew that there was something that was missing. I got competent at what I did in the law, but I didn't like it. I didn't love what I was doing. And I did other things to make myself feel fulfilled. I became a serial nonprofit board joiner. I volunteered to go to events. I liked sitting at tables and talking to people and collecting networks of people. I like learning about people's life experiences. Um, I didn't know that this was going to be helpful, but this is where the social capital comes in. I volunteered a lot on social committees. I am the first person to join social committees, as Wei knows. She needed volunteers for Bentley's Philly office to do lunches and events, and I was like, that's me. I love throwing parties. At a certain point, though, um, I've been a lawyer for 20 years, over 20 years. I became good at my job. I uh, said people need me, but I don't like it. I need a plan. I need an exit plan, a plan to get me to a job that I was good at, that I would like, that paid me. That brings me to Bentley Systems. I have been with Bentley for about eight years now. A friend who I knew from being on the board of the University City Arts League told me about an open attorney position. And he went to bat for me, and I ended up getting that job that maybe 50, 60 lawyers had applied for because of this one social connection and the relationship I had formed by serving alongside a nonprofit board with Yap Veneman, if the Bentley people know Yap. See how this is working? I worked hard, did things along the way that brought me joy, felt no joy, and then decided to get out, used my social capital from being a serial nonprofit board joiner, and then eventually landed me a lifetime job at Bentley Systems. For those of you who are not familiar with Bentley, you're in the vast majority. We are not the car company. We are the software infrastructure company. We literally innovate all of the world's infrastructure, including in the water industry. And so I thought when I got there, whoa, I just landed a job at this amazing company, and I have no idea what they do. We build all of the world's infrastructure. Wow. <laughs> I worked hard at learning that business because I came from a law firm and then I worked at Burlington Coat Factory stores. To, so to go from off-price retail to software was something where I felt like I had imposter syndrome. But I worked really hard, learned the business, uh, you know, went to lunches, did that same thing with gaining social capital, getting to know my colleagues. And you know what? I went to, I got to a point where being at Bentley, I was doing their privacy and data security work, same questions. I'm competent at my job now. Do I like, love my job? No, I needed a plan. And I have a steering committee of girlfriends that I have collected over the years. They literally are like my board of directors of my personal and professional life. And so I went to them and said, what do I do? And they were like, you love getting people like involved. You love parties. Think about doing something where you can make everyone in that company feel a culture of inclusion. And I thought, wait a second, you know, there's this need, this gap now. We are just like in the pandemic, post George Floyd, for a diversity program here. We did not have one. So I came up with a plan. I got my certification from the Yale Management School in Fostering Diversity in Organizations. And I put up my hand and said, I would like to head this program. And that happened. That was a big stretch for me. I'm a lawyer. I don't do diversity, but I am very good at putting together parties, which a compliance program or a diversity program feels like to me. We have our first director of diversity here, Natalie Plummer, who has since taken over the lead role and has made it a world-class program at Bentley where our colleagues feel like they are included, whoever they are, and for the first time, we did this transition from we are kind of colorblind to no, we're not colorblind. Everybody's got an identity. You are all different, and we want you here, and we got to figure out how to take advantage of your specific skill sets and get the best out of you. So that's what happened with diversity. Next thing happened where Bentley went public about two and a half years ago. We started an ESG program. Does anybody know what ESG means? Of course you do, because you're Ivy League students and graduates. I did not. <laughs> 
as my boss is asking me to lead the ESG program, I'm Googling ESG, and I was like, oh, environmental social governance. Well, this is a thing, and this is my thing. I love all of those things. So we started an ESG program, and back to Howard Newkrug and me moving into his block, my first hire for our ESG program manager is Joe Newkrug, sitting right there, Howard's son. <laughs> so proximity, social capital, relationship building, opportunities, and a plan. And I'm happy to tell you our ESG program is about two and a half years old. It's pretty young for the industry, but we are like scoring A's. It's quite remarkable what you can do in two and a half years if you put in the time, the hard work, and the know-how. So ensuring that we are bringing up future water professionals became very important to me as I am sitting there literally like living next door to Howard and his son is working at Bentley. And under Joe's leadership, we've been able to make near-term net zero carbon commitments, which I didn't care about a couple of years ago, but now I'm deeply involved in extreme climate change and investing at, in the pipeline of new leaders in sustainability and the water industry. Back to the fact that I am not a water expert or professional. So what do I do when I don't know? I ask an expert. I went to Bentley's Distinguished Water Scholar, and we have one. His name is Tom Walski. It's a crazy title, but if you ever talk to him, he is like amazing. He's been in the water industry for about 50 years. And I asked him to help me with this keynote, and here is what he wrote back. Could you go to the slide with the world of water? Perfect. This is literally Tom Walski emailing me yesterday. There is a lot of opportunity in water. Where do you see yourself fitting into this world of water? It's not all about sitting idyllically next to a mountain stream. It's about getting into sewer pipes and people yelling at you for blocking traffic when you are trying to fix a water main break. There are so many different opportunities, sewage, stormwater, clean water, with so many different organizations, owners and operators, engineering firms, consulting firms, equipment and hardware companies that make pipes, pumps, fire hydrants, meters. Do you like to sell things? Because you can make a lot of money if you're good at sales. Do you like to dig and construct things? These are the companies that hire a lot of people. If you are playing the percentage of open position game, then do not go to regulators like the EPA or academia or nonprofit organizations like the Water Center. They are not organizations that hire a lot of people. For every application, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands. And then he yelled out a organization called Ecologia. Ecologia? Are you familiar with that organization, Howard? It was started by a husband and wife team. Um, they were Penn sociology graduates. And when the Soviet Union busted up, they went in there to the former Soviet Union to train people on environmental activism. It was not popular with the government, but they were deeply involved in environmental and sustainable development issues in unstable societies. Tom was writing this and I was fascinated and I looked up this organization and this organization was born of a passion of a husband and wife team who were just undergrads. And in the intervening years, they've done so much and they're still at it in Ukraine and other places right now. What does Bentley do? Can you advance to the Bentley slide? We do software. The biggest areas of employment at Bentley is writing software and selling it. But we have all, we have all kinds of adjacent business streams, including legal, including running a big company with diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've got Chris Nagel here, our Temple intern, who has supported a lot of our corporate responsibility initiatives. Um, business, marketing, technical support, people who are good with teaching our accounts and users how to really optimize our software. Where do you fit in? You should look at your career choices, gain competency through hard work and perseverance, but every once in a while, check yourself. Next slide. Next slide. You should be positive in all of that, but as you're gaining competency, you should check yourself and ask, do you like what you do? Are you good at it? Do people need you? Will someone pay you? 
If you can't meet those four, make a plan. A plan only takes, you know, a few months, a couple of years. Find somebody that you emulate, find the career that you want, figure out how to get there, social capital, network, just do things that you like and you'll meet people that way. And keep doing the things that bring you joy. Eventually it will lead you to a career or a job where you can affirmatively say, yes, I've attained all four of these things. And for me, that's Bentley right now. It could change, but like I said, form a plan and execute it. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk to the Water Center students and people. There's Thomas that I just met again for the second year right there in the Patagonia Fleece. And it's really encouraging to see people year after year because that's all it takes, showing up and forming relationships. And you will get to the places that you want to. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, for this insightful um, presentation where you got to talk to us about your career pathways and then Leeds uh, mission. So uh, we're going to, going to take some questions from the audience. So if you want to raise your hand, the microphone will be going to you. We have one for Howard. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, you know what? Tom said that this concept came from Japan. Okay. Um, and I wasn't familiar with it. And he, he was so kind. He fed me the slides to, you know, his emails. Um, but I'm not exactly sure what that means. But this is some sort of, you know, some kind of like life happiness thing that came from a concept in Japan. And it makes it, you know, every once in a while, you're going through your life and you're slogging and you just need a talisman. And I feel like things like this, if you, if you say, yeah, this makes sense, and you embrace it, it'll come back to you every once in a while. Um, and you'll remember you know, to go out and do things that bring you joy and to stop and think, do I need to make a change? Because leaving a situation is also as important as like joining one. There you go. And water is an easy, easy sell. I mean, if you've ever seen water insecurity, um, Bentley has this program with Engineers Without Borders. And during the pandemic, a few um, enge engineering students who were juniors and seniors at the University of Delaware built a bridge with a model digital twin in their dorm room for a remote village in Africa and they sent, Bentley supplied the money and the support to send supplies to that village. And when the travel restrictions ended, these, these engineering students went to that village, helped build the bridge with the, the African village people. And what that enabled the children of the village to do was stop fetching clean water because that took days because the girls were walking and walking. Uh, miles to get clean water in buckets and water is heavy and so they weren't able to go to school that bridge enabled them to go to school because they saved so much time so water is really important it's access even education at this point gender equity it's really heartening to see so many you know females in this room because you would have not seen that decades or even a couple of years ago so we've come a long way and we need all those differing perspectives and life experiences to innovate and make sure that we are providing access to water education to everybody my main goal for the future i've got three sons who are 12 10 and 6 my goal is to make sure that they adhere to these four buckets. They have all of the opportunity in the world. My husband and I are both lawyers. We speak English. We can help them with their homework, unlike my parents who are always working. They've got all of the privilege and entitlement in the world. I need them to use it for good. So that's my focus. Thank you. Thank you again for speaking with us. And uh, if anybody wants to speak with uh, Angela or the Berlin team, they're right here. Okay, so, all right. Um, 
Now it's time to, for a panel discussion on mapping your path to success. I'm excited to welcome our panelists, Colleen Arnold, Devish Sarma, Laura Canto Ovist, and Kendra Morris. Please come to the stage with us for a minute. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you now, and then you'll have some time to talk with us as well, okay? So, Colleen Arnold is president of the Aqua Division of Essential Utilities. She was previously deputy chief operating officer for Aqua, a role she held since September 2015. Colleen is a licensed professional engineer in Delaware. She earned her BS in civil engineering from the University of Massachusetts her MS in Environmental Engineering from Manhattan College, and her Executive MBA from Villanova University. Devesh Sarma is, a, is the Chief Executive Officer for Aquatech International, a global leader in water purification technology for industrial and infrastructure markets. Devesh has been with Aquatech since 1997, and he has worked in virtually every facet of the company from commissioning, process engineering, project management, and business development. Devesh holds a degree in chemical engineering and industrial management from Carnegie Mellon University and an MBA from INSEAD. Laura Canto Ovest is the Chief Sustainability Officer at Solenis. Laura has more than 25 years of experience in a variety of different positions, from sales and application support for pulp and paper customers to leading positions in market development and R&D. She received a MS in chemical engineering from Chalmers Technical University in Sweden and her PhD in industrial microbiology from Helsinki University in Finland. And Kendra Morris has 15 years of experience developing sustainable public infrastructure. Currently, she is the president of the Northeast region for Veolia, North America, where she partners with municipal leaders to bring affordable and smart water solutions to communities. She earned her Bachelor of Arts in Economics and Political Science and a Master's of City and Regional Planning both from the University of Pennsylvania. So welcome all of you. <laughs> okay, um, Colleen, would you mind to begin? No, I'm thrilled to, and I'm so happy to be here today. Similar to Angela, before I get into a little bit about Aqua and Essential Utilities, if you all humor me in, in going down my uh, career path, I've worked, I've had the great fortune, and again, I'm thrilled to be in the Water Policy Center with people interested in water, because I've worked in water my whole career, uh, going on 30 years now. So I was an undergrad at UMass, like you heard, and, and I started doing jar tests and treatability tests. Um, I knew I wanted to be an environmental engineer, and um, at that time, there were only two undergrad environmental engineering programs, so I went on straight through for my master's and worked in New York City, um, Hudson River water quality modelers. Uh, again, and I keep looking at Howard. So after I graduated engineering, I started out in consulting engineering and worked for a company called CDM. And one of my first projects was, um, it was really awesome as a first project to work on. Sometimes you get, uh, you know, more grunt work type things, but I was piloting water treatment. New York City has a filtration waiver um, some of the most uh, protected watersheds in uh, the country, um, and that's how they're enabled to do this water filtration waiver, but they had a pilot treatment. So I was operating this mobile trailer, one million gallons a day, could actually feed an actual community, <laughs> quite a big community um, water supply at different points along the Catskill Delaware watershed. Um, I don't know if all the panelists will have a Howard story, but so I'm a young engineer, 23, <laughs> operating this pilot plant. And um, the, uh, one of the engineers we were working with, it was a joint venture with Hazen and Sawyer, said, hey, you know, this fellow Howard Newcrub's going to come by and visit. 
Um, so I actually met you at that time. You were young. <laughs> I don't even know if you remember, um, but gave Howard a tour of this advanced treatment plant pilot. And Philadelphia ended up putting in some pilots, not a mobile trailer, but a few years down the road. Back then, the big issues were cryptosporidium and DBPs and DBP, you know, those, those are all still issues, but, you know, evolving into PFAS and other things. So I spent the beginning of my career as a consultant and um, actually doing that pilot treatment gave me the bug to go back to school. I thought I wanted to be a professor. I thought I wanted to teach. Um, and I found out, as, and there are good paths for all of them, and I think you had a good slide that showed there's many different aspects you can work in. But I found out that um, academic professors at most universities, it, it's really about research more than teaching. Not, not the good ones, but you, know, you have to bring in the money for the university and the research ends up being, um, like I was doing PhD research on particle bubble attachment. Really important in terms of processes, um, dissolved air flotation is a process that we use in water treatment, but it was a little bit too academic for me. So um, got a great amount of knowledge. I cut my losses. We, we talked about that a little bit. You kind of learn from everything you do, but it might not be the right fit. Um, and I went back into consulting for a little while. I consulted for Philadelphia. And then um, as I was starting a family, um, even in consulting, I was able to work part time, but there really is no part time in my experience as a consultant. And so that's when I moved over to the utility operations side. Um, as a consultant, pluses and minuses to everything. You can delve into a project and see it from beginning to end. You get to the utility operations side and there are so many different projects over so many different aspects of uh, being a utility that you, um, you're you not really an expert anymore, but there's a whole breadth of things to get involved in, in terms of uh, working in utility operations. So I was always really technical. Um, I managed a water quality lab for the city of Wilmington. I ended up being a director of um, the you know both stormwater there at combined sewer community the drinking water plants wastewater plant um, did an energy performance contract uh, in city government what i found um, there's no there's no end to what you can do um, there are, you might feel a little bit limited and i remember one of the best advice i ever got from one of my bosses was if you see a vacuum fill it I think sometimes we graduate and, and we're ready for somebody to just kind of give us the path. Um, and so as much as, um, you know, some people may have thought I took a step back from consulting to work in city government, I had, you know, earned less money or had, could have had more earning potential on the other path. I learned so much about so many aspects. And then that really qualified me for um, my children got older. And I thought that working for a private utility might be a really good balance between consulting and uh, utility operations at a city. So I've been in different roles for Aqua. Um, currently, I'm the head of operations. I'll talk to you a little bit more now about Aqua. Um, just one more thing on the career thing before I get into Aqua and Essential. Um, I did get my MBA, as you heard. That was probably about five years ago. And there was probably one person who was older than I in the MBA class. And I remember one of um, the classes we were taking was about system design and um, design thinking. And there was this book from really smart PhDs coming out of Stanford about design your life. And it was kind of like, if you filled out these forms in this book and talked about your networking paths, you know, here's your career. And I think a lot of what Angela spoke about, like it's all there, like find your joy um, and you have to have a plan. But as I was sitting in that room, and again, you know, a lot of younger people than I by probably 20 years, and they're all taking notes like, all right, this is how I become a CEO. Um, and I just like to say it doesn't quite work like that. Um, and even now, as we're hiring new people, you know, young, promising professionals into our field, they're kind of coming to us and being like, all right, where's my career path? And, and we can give you pathways. We can give you different progression guidance. but. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's as easy as that. And a lot of times you have to take a lateral move to maybe find your other joy or your, your way up into another role. And I certainly never set out to be, you know, president of a utility company with 1,500 employees under me and serving water to a million people. I never set out a path like, all right, this is how I get there. 
So I just kind of want to give you some of that context. I know maybe you're looking for certainty at this point. The best thing I can tell you is, is be open um, and, and sometimes taking a lateral move. Okay, so Aqua is the water division of essential utilities. About three years ago, right before COVID hit, um, Aqua ended up merging or, or acquiring a gas utility, and that's when we became essential utilities. About 750,000 connections in the Pittsburgh area, people's gas. Um, it's the first time really where we were in an urban footprint. We've always, we grew up in the Philadelphia suburban area and our, the rest of our operations are more rural or suburban. And then going to Aqua, I think I mentioned this already in terms of our number of employees. You know, we have, I think one of the things that makes us unique um, in the private regulated water space, we have 1,500 water systems and 200 wastewater systems across eight states. And um, a lot of those are very small. And I think as we look at water, um, being able to provide, I know it's, it's part of what keeps me up every night, um, being able to provide that same level of service to smaller rural uh, communities is a real challenge. We're really proud of our laboratory. It's right in this region. I think we have had some students from the Policy Center come over and visit. Um, it's a state-of-the-art laboratory. We were, we were doing some of the analyses when the Delaware River spill occurred. Um, and again, encourage any of you, it's in, the, it's in the region up in Bryn Mawr. We're the only certified lab in Pennsylvania right now doing PFAS. Um, and uh, would love to have some visitors and, and show you the lab, show the lab off. We'll go through these pretty quickly and can kind of keep them up there, but you know what, having worked again in different sides, consultant, city municipality utility, now an investor owned, each has its advantages, each has its niche or, or fill in the water industry. Um, but as a, a private, we do have access to equity and dollars that enables us to do a lot of infrastructure investment. Um, and so we're really proud of, of the capital program and getting solutions built for some of the communities out there. So these are wastewater plants. Um, we can keep going. Water quality, PFAS, you know, those are some of the, you know, we're always trying to stay ahead on the issues. Um, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, as much as we are you know, spread out across eight states, water is always local. Um, and as much as we're making these infrastructure improvements, we're not making them and walking away. Um, the only way for any of this to be successful is to be a community partner and be a long-term part of that community. And so that's, that's bread and butter with us doing the infrastructure investment. Um, I think that's about it, and I'm going to be really happy with, to hear what the other panelists have to say and, and hopefully get some good questions. So, okay, good. So, we, so um, we didn't even plan it. <laughs> yeah, we didn't plan it that way. Um, my name is Devesh Sharma. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, born and raised, and I know Howard, but I don't have a Howard story. <laughs> You'll have one. Yes, wait till tonight. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Aquatech. Um, as you can see on the screen, um, we're specialists in water technology. As, as our name suggests, we're a 43-year-old company, started in 1981 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And, um, you know, we focus on water scarcity. Um, actually, we're here talking about water, but there's another side of our business that we do resource recovery. And, uh, you know, what that is all about is we uh, produce lithium. You know, lithium comes from brines, and we have the technology, the same technology that you use to separate impurities from water and go zero liquid discharge is the other side of the coin is, let's get the water out of there, let's get the lithium. So it's, it's a big growing part of our business, but it's, it's really relevant because, um, you know, water is something that's so essential um, but for years, you know, for decades, I've been in, in the water industry and people say, oh, you're in water, water's so important. Um, you know, the next war is gonna be fought over water. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, no. Nah. 
oil gets all the love, okay? Because water, and you know, it's something we've been talking about with the water centers, we have to do more work about the value of water around the world because, you know, but, but my point is, is now, you know, three decades into my career, water is taking a front and center role. You know, uh, I think Angela talked about ESG. Um, we're a company that works for companies. We, we're a business to business uh, uh, endeavor. Um, we help some of the world's most recognized companies solve their water challenges. And every boardroom is worried about their image, their operations, their viability because of dwindling water resources. And, and really, we provide the technologies to help them uh, address those challenges. If I could have the next slide. So as I said, 43-year-old company. We've done over 2,000 plants around the world uh, on six continents, um, about 700 uh, engineers, probably more than about 1,000 people. Um, and uh, over our systems around the world treat over 1.6 billion gallons of water a day. Um, headquarters in Pittsburgh, and um, really proud to say I was I was actually in an employee orientation yesterday, and uh, we had uh, um, you know probably in the last six months maybe about 40 new employees, and I said you know it's a very interesting time you know as as Maria said we're all hiring it's it's a good time for 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 the industry. And I said, uh, you guys have a really unique situation because you have a 33% chance that you're going to meet someone that's just like you that's been here for less than 18 months. And you have a 66% chance that you meet someone that's been in this company over 20 years. There's no in-between. Uh, and and that, that's a really interesting dynamic with our company. Uh, there's a joke that if you just manage five years, you're, you're there for life. Um, and I think that's a good thing. Um, so we, we're really proud of our our. Um, you know, uh, ability to, to retain uh, uh, a team. And, you know, once you get into 15 or 20 years, it becomes a family. So, you know, that's, that's really the culture at Aquatech. Um, next slide, please. So what do we do? Um, if I could put 90% of what we do in four buckets, we help our clients solve water scarcity. We reuse water. We take water from, from unconventional sources, desalinating seawater. Uh, water reuse. When you reuse water, you keep concentrating it up, you create a brine, we have the technology to take it to zero liquid discharge so there's no uh, uh, liquid pollution. Um, I talked about the lithium and the critical minerals. Uh, just industrial water management. Um, you know, one of our most recent projects is, uh, you know, they're building a new steel plant in Sweden uh, where they're going to make green steel from hydrogen, you know. And we're, you know, any, any industrial process takes a lot of water, whether it's microchips, automotive, um, power, oil and gas, everybody uses water. So we help manage the water in, uh, recycle the water out, manage the water footprint of, of our clients. And of course, desalinating seawater. As water scarcity in the world grows, the sea is an increasingly used source. It's uh, uh, the most difficult, it's, you know, highly saline water, takes a lot of energy, but yet it's, it's, a, it's a very important piece of the puzzle in, in water security. How do we do it? Um, so I told you about all these technologies, all these things to do. Well, what do is it that we really do? Well, sometimes we build the plant, you know, we, we, we provide the process technology, we build the plant that purifies the water. A lot of times that goes with operating it. Um, we have a subsidiary because we're a very technology focused company. Sometimes we just sell pieces of technology, membranes, instruments that help purify water, help measure water. Uh, and also sometimes you put it all together and you sell the water. You can finance, build, own, operate the plant and, and go to an industry and say, industry, you focus on making your steel. We're going to be outside the fence here. We're going to supply you the water you need at the specification you need it and we're going to take your waste and we're going to process it and you pay a monthly fee. So this really encapsulates uh, uh, what we do as a company. So um, some of our clients, we have a, a blue chip list of clients, really the who's who across industry in our, in our 43 years. Um, and um, that's, that's really all I wanted to say about the company. Now um, to, to follow Colleen, I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey. Um, I've been with the same company my whole career, uh, and I've had the 
fortunate ability to have really worked in every facet of the business. Um, you know, even even in my, my first summer, I I was very very fortunate, and I would I would provide this advice to anyone. Uh, in this industry, there is nothing better than field experience because you see it. You know, you sit down and you can look at engineering documents and you can say, oh, that's a valve and you can have all this bookish, bookish knowledge that, that you know, the, the velocity of water is this much and this much filtration is going to happen, but you really don't live it until you do those jar tests. <laughs> and, 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 and you understand how water reacts and you, you see the plant and you start up the plant. So, so you know, I had the fortunate ability to, to do that early in my career. Um, and, and you don't just learn engineering. You, you know so much about what you um, learn in school really kind of gets you your first job. And then, you, you know, you can take all of that and... <laughs> And put it on a shelf somewhere, and then it's you. Then it's it's what what you learn. It's how you interact with people. It's 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 how you um, um, you know can comport yourself. And 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 communication skills are very important. So you know, I got to move on. Came back to the office and started designing those plants. And you know, was a process engineer. Learned how to design the plants. Learned how much the plants costed. Learned how the different tricks in the trade were to support the sales team. Um, did a little bit of project management and, and managed how the projects are, are built, uh, how to manage a schedule, how to deal with angry clients saying, you know, well, this isn't done, this is late. Um, you know, really learn customer service. And then eventually moved on to, to more management, business development. Another big milestone in my career is uh, around 2005, I got the opportunity to move overseas. Uh, and I built our Asian operations. Um, we had a big office there that did engineering, but we wanted to turn it more into a sales and service. And really, you know, after seven or eight years, uh, um, when I left, it really became our, our Eastern Hemisphere headquarters. Um, so, you know, kind of walking through this path, I, I wanted to double down uh, on, on what Colleen said is, um, I don't know exactly how you put it, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna use my own words here a bit, but it's the same essence. It's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And um, I hear a lot in our um, recruitment now, uh, my, my, our VP of HR was telling me last week is that, is that oh, kids today are being taught that they need to change jobs every two years. And that's like, that's like fingernails on a chalkboard <laughs> for me. But, but I have to say it's our responsibility as employers to, to emulate what I manage and I was fortunate to have in my career. We got to, I would say don't change jobs, but change jobs within the company. And if the company can give you those opportunities, that's a good employer. But, and, and of course, not everybody, very low percentage stay with their, the same employer their whole career. Um, you are going to make moves and, and then you're going to find that, that, that place that hits all those four cylinders. Um, but, but I can't stress enough that, that the goal isn't uh, um, you know, the salary is important, the money is important, the soft issues are important, but if you don't have the fundamental knowledge, you're not going to be able to offer anything to your employer long term because you won't, you'll be a mile wide and an inch deep. And, and that's, that's one thing is that, is that you got to spend your time in your 20s building depth. And, and, and that's, that's really just, just one of the things I, I'm sure we're going to talk more with with, with questions, but uh, with that, I'd like to hand it over. So, uh, thank you so much. And we have heard so much fantastic things about the careers of these two persons. Thank you so much. Uh, so, my name is Lotta Kanto Ökvist, and I'm originally from Sweden. So, oh, I actually bought some, I bought some shares, actually, in that company <laughs> that are uh, now... Uh, want to produce green steel, I believe in that. 
Okay. Very much. So now I feel very safe that you're involved as well. Excellent. Uh, so one of the things we talk about, I'm working for Solenis, and we talked about the amount of years you stay in a company, for example. 25 plus years in the industry. An important thing, like both of you have been saying it, hands-on experience, don't do something, uh, you know, and believe that you could have a career path just going direct. There is a ladder that is straight to the top and without having the technical background. I also started in the beginning of my career really doing, what you could say, the pinks and blue, being in sales, being at customer sites. Uh, and if you, as you can understand, you know, all of these things, like Angela was saying, is this the right thing to do? Everything from sales, applications, corporate communications, market developments. Where is my place? I didn't change the company. I took on challenges all the time from really the technical to understand and use my education to build on my experience that I have in a lot of different areas and the different industry. We talked, uh, you heard about the pulp and paper industry. It's an industry using a huge amount of water, okay? Mm -hmm. But also R&D for industrial segment, you know, cooling water, wastewater treatment, all of the things that I'm responsible for today. Is that to understand this, what we were taught in school and use it in reality, not only on a paper, really get the hands on the things is something that are developing your future career. And, and career is not the ladder just straight to the top. It's a jungle gym. And what I can say based on my experience, is that I never said no to a challenge. I've always taken on a lot of different topics, and the more difficult they were, the better. You know, the challenge to be able to solve something, doesn't matter which area it was. And there you get networking, communication skills. You will uh, make sure that you actually understand the broader perspective of what's this all about. And in the end, you find your path. And I'm now the chief sustainability officer with a huge passion for water and for ESG, environmental, social, and governance at Solenis. And all of the experience I have based on my education and all of the work that I've been doing throughout my career has been a fantastic thing for me. And I just want to share that with all of you. Take the opportunities and chances and challenges and don't plan too much. I didn't plan to sit here, but I'm here today <laughs> and I'm extremely happy about it. So let me talk a little bit more about Solenis. Let us talk about my passion is water, which I hope you've understood now. And the big mega trend, why we are doing this, why the water center was built now by Howard and Joanne and why we're focusing is that we have a water scarcity around the globe in all countries. And if you look at this heat map, this is what is predicted to be very critical areas until 2030. And if you look at it, the, if we continue the way we do now, uh, only about 60%, we will have only about 60% of the water we need in 2030. Isn't it scary? I think it's scary. The agriculture area are using 70% of the water. So it actually can influence the food chain and our, food, our future food <coughs> supply. And these are the things that we need to think about. All of the things are connected. And that makes me happy to work for the company I work for today. Let's look at the, at the pie chart on the bottom, impacts. So about 20% are the industrial sector, 10% municipalities, and the 70% is, is uh, agriculture. So what can we influence? Because this is important for me in my career and the work I'm doing to feel passionate. What can we influence? And do I have a job where I feel that I can do, make a difference? So if we take the next slide, we just acquired a new company uh, into our, we have been acquiring a lot of different company, but the last one was Diversity and also Cedar Camp, which is a wastewater company here in the US. But Diversity was the biggest one now. So now we are 15,400 employees around the globe 
And you can see on the small do not charts up there, they're a little bit too small. You, you get the presentation afterwards. All of the different industries and municipalities that we are active in now, including food and beverage now, and hospitality business, which is also restaurants, laundries, everything using a lot of water and the industrial segments. Uh, and as I said, also the consumer is the uh, paper industry. And pools, your recreational pools. Don't forget them. They're using a lot of water as well. But what I feel really passionate about is to be able to work for a company where we can make a difference. We are $7.2 billion in revenue now since the 5th of July. So it's kind of new. We are in the integration phase. But we are all over the world. We're one global team, 71 manufacturing sites, and we can reach everywhere where water treatment and water are used to make sure that we make a better world. And we like to partner with companies that have uh, a lot of programming and engineering skills as well. But we are a special ma uh, chemical manufacturing company. So we have the products needed for all of the different equi equipments to separate anything out of the system or clean or, or make sure that we can maintain the business. So next slide, please. So we have different solutions. Like I said, wastewater uh, management and reduce from a product point of view, monitoring, cleanliness. Uh, we, we, you know, all of the plastic reduction, we want to have fiber based material waste. These are something we are focusing on as well. Circular economy, making sure that we are not destroying and get more microplastics or nanoplastics into the environment. So fiber solutions. Infection prevention, one of the things is very important is uh, we know that from COVID, but also on water. Water needs to be safe for people to drink all around the world. And of course, the food and beverage safety now. We know it's important. They are a huge user of water. And we now um, have the possibility to actually do something about it as well, for some process and recycling of water and reuse. Next. So we deliver solutions for all of the different megatrends. So climate change, CO2 emissions, water scarcity, like we, we just talked about it, it's one big thing. One of the things that's very important as well, when you're cycling up a cooling tower, for example, you can get corrosion or you, you have to think about the acid protection as well. You're concentrating um, a lot of salts and things you know, into systems and we can treat for that. The regulatory compliance, of course, it needs to be safe for personnel working in a factory as well as everybody else. But the digital solution here, performance-based control calculation, extremely important. Uh, for the future and combining it with treatment is equipment and engineering solutions with products and with programming and everything together and we need to work together for the future to make uh, all these uh, programs work and next slide please so we work from river to river and here you can see all of the different treatment uh, possibilities that we do have. We have all of the products, monitoring and control and digital solutions. And all of, uh, we have a strong focus, of course, on sustainable solution, carbon footprint of products, etc. And we are delivering uh, value to the customers by all of the major sustainability parameters that they have, that they need to meet with their sustainability targets and goals. ESG. So next one, please. So we have talked very much about uh, the different things, ESG. So environmental, social and governance, very important for us. The social engagement around customers as well as plants, extremely important in uh, conjunction with also the environmental work that we do. But we can't do that alone. And actually, if we want to change something in the world, it's to do it together with the customers, which are the industries that are using a lot of water or also partnerships with, can be universities, the water center, can be also uh, a lot of different companies. We have to do this together to make sure that we make a difference in the world. So it's in water, so we call it ESG plus C. I just want to show you uh, a couple of awards that we have, or one specific one is Corporate uh, Social Responsibility Ecovadis, uh, where we are top 1% percentile. 
uh, we for the second uh, year in the row we had that and we had gold rating before that so sustainability ESG is very high on the priority and that's why I feel passionate just working for Solenis as well and feel that I can with the help of what we're doing contribute to a better world just this is actually the last slide I'm having or the second last slide I just wanted to show you it's not only about chemistry today i have with me mike bloomley from the wilmington research center solenis has the headquarter in wilmington delaware just neighbors to here huh so mike bloomley is working at the research center where we are investing in a new research center for 40 million as well then we have uh, brian panicella and sam hager um, Brian is uh, they're working in the merger and acquisition team because that is also one of the things that's very important what do we do to make sure that we are even better and more suited for the future in what we're doing and Brian he used to be a student here and Sam he started actually as an intern and he just got hired so as you know we are looking for interns as well <laughs> But look at this one. There is so much different positions that are important for what we do. So it's not just a chemistry background or a water background or an equipment background. There's space for everybody to be a contributor in what we are doing. And we are always hiring, by the way. Next slide, please. So job opportunities. I just want you to think about going to solenis.com. You'll find our sustainability report, a lot of information there about us as well, and go in under careers in North America. You will feel, find all of the job uh, positions that we have, and you can apply online. And at the moment, we have several internships out there, but also other positions. And as I said, you know, what, what is it, 45 minutes from here? Um, Wilmington. It's not Pennsylvania, it's Wilmington in, uh, in Delaware, but it's okay. Huh? <laughs> so go and join us and go to and come and talk to us and we will tell you more about what we're doing. So thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon, I'm Kendra Morris. I only have one slide, so this will be easy for whoever's <laughs> doing the slide clicking. Um, I love being back at Penn. Um, I was an undergrad here at Penn, and I thought I'd walk you through a little bit about my, my background and how I ended up to where I am, um, and then go into a little bit about who Veolia is, the company I work for. So um, right now, just so you know where I'm coming from, I'm the president of our Northeast region for the municipal water business for Veolia North America. It's a very long title, which I didn't put all on the slide. Um, so, that's my current role, um, but let me back up. So I was a 2005 graduate um, from the School of Arts and Sciences um, here, and so lovely to come walk down Locust Walk. Penn has changed so much, um, and all for the better. It looks beautiful, and you guys are very lucky to be here. Um, I got my undergraduate degree in international relations, which is a combination of uh, political science, economics, and history. Why? Because I couldn't choose what I wanted to study. And so I didn't have to declare until the end of my sophomore year, and that allowed me to have three majors in one. Um, and when I graduated, I actually took a job um, in Philadelphia working for a charter elementary school in their foundation. So I was doing fundraising, I was doing grant writing and storytelling. Um, and the mayor of Philadelphia, Michael Nutter at the time, talked about city planning. And I thought, what is this city planning? You know, I've no, I haven't heard of that. Um, and at the time I was watching The Wire. Did anyone ever see that show, The Wire? Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, what is happening to our cities in the US? There has to be a better way um, to help manage the, the physical part of our cities, the physical infrastructure of our cities that's contributing to some of these um, issues that we're seeing that I was witnessing in the inner city school and on the wire. <laughs> so um, I, I looked around and I found the School of Design here and they have a Master's of City and Regional Planning. And so um, I applied, I came here to study. Um, and actually during my studies here, um, I found two people who are in the room. One is Joanne. I was an intern with the IGEL program 
for those who were here when IGEL was around. Um, and the other is Howard Newkruk. And so Howard doesn't know this, actually. I do have a Howard story. Um, but he doesn't know this, so he's hearing it for the first time. So one of my um, assignments what, during grad school was to you know, pick a topic that interests you. So I picked um, combined sewers in the city of Philadelphia. And I was fascinated by the history of it. Why did we build sewers? What happened to the Schuylkill River? By the way, I was a rower out on the Schuylkill River. People got ringworm. My sister who's sitting over there, I think, was a rower too. She came home with ringworm one time from the water in the Schuylkill. You did. Um, but it was like, why is this happening? What's happening with the water quality in our city? And, and how did it get to the point where there are, you know, there's water quality contamination issues? So anyway, I, I studied um, what Howard was doing with the city of Philadelphia's uh, water department um, and read a lot of what you, you didn't know this at the time, but it was very inspired by what you were doing and really trying to turn around the water department with stormwater um, fees, stormwater utility ideas, and wrote a whole paper on it. And that got me fascinated in the water infrastructure space. <laughs> you can, I still have it. Um, and when I graduated from um, city and regional planning, I um, was very passionate at the time about infrastructure, infrastructure finance. I had taken corporate finance classes at Wharton. Um, and I said, we have a huge issue in the US on water infrastructure, all types of infrastructure. I mean, roads, bridges, bridges collapsing. You guys are aware of this. Um, social infrastructure with courthouses, with schools. Um, and so I joined an infrastructure fund, Meridium, um, which is based out of New York City. And I spent three years learning how do we mix private equity with public infrastructure dollars and use private expertise in designing, constructing, um, operating public infrastructure, um, really meld together the public and private and help make our cities, make our regions and our counties um, a little bit more sustainable from an infrastructure perspective. Um, I'm very passionate about that because I firmly believe that infrastructure is the core of economic development um, for all of our cities. And I also think that infrastructure is the core of public health, especially when you're talking about water and wastewater and stormwater infrastructure. Um, along all of this, I've always been very passionate about environmental protection. And I had an opportunity to move over exclusively to the water side. So I went to American Water. And I worked um, with a few people who are in the room now who I see, um, working on their contract operations side. So many people in this room may understand where your drinking water and wastewater comes from or goes to, um, but most people don't. But a lot of cities will actually uh, seek expertise and they recognize we do not have the city staff to properly operate and maintain our water treatment uh, plants or our underground networks or our wastewater treatment plants. So we're going to hire a company that is an expert in this, that is bringing professional water operations. And so my job was to help go uh, partner with cities and sign new contracts for American Water. Um, you guys probably know American Water best because of its uh, regulated utility or investor-owned utility where they're actually owning and operating the assets. Um, but I was on the contract operations side of that. Um, and then Suez, a French company, um, poached me from American Water, as so often happens in the water space, as you will learn if you join us. Um, it's a very, very small industry, and people move around jobs all the time. <laughs> um, also another reason never to burn your bridges, because you will run into that person at a, at a conference probably Absolutely. in the future. Um, and at Suez, we were um, doing the same thing, contract operations. Suez is a French company, global environmental services company. Um, and Veolia, you'll see, um, acquired Suez uh, a year and a half ago. And so now I'm at, at Veolia, but we essentially do the same thing. Um, so I'll focus on what Veolia does. Um, Veolia is a environmental services company that focuses on not just water, meaning um, municipal water, drinking water, wastewater, stormwater, but also industrial water. You've heard a lot of the fellow panelists talk about the amount of water that is used to produce products or to create food and beverage. Um, so Veolia also uh, manufactures technologies that go into um, industrial production processes. Um, they also focus quite a lot on waste. So in Europe, they do a lot of solid waste. They do recycling. In the US here, we do hazardous waste. Um, they also focus on energy, um, energy efficiency, renewable energy. And so it's this um, you know, little triangle of um, environmental services that are, are critical to all of our daily lives, um, but things that we don't often think about. Um, and water is really at the core, I think, of, of everything that has to do with the environment. Um, and the purpose of Veolia is to be the champion of ecological transformation. We have a little purpose wheel that has the UN Sustainable Development Goal colors around it, um, which I love. Um, 
and it's very interesting to have a French company declare that they're the, the champion of ecological transformation and come to the United States, where we have a lot of cities that are like, you, you, what, you're the champion of what? <laughs> what, is, what is that word? Um, and and it's, uh, I've been in this space for a long time talking to cities about their goals with water. And I will say that in the last five years, there has been a shift in a lot of uh, medium size to larger cities where they are recognizing that this ecological transformation, which I'll put in quotes, is what their residents want to hear. So the smaller cities, maybe not so much, but the, the medium and bigger cities are, are getting on board with, we need to decarbonize. We need to reduce our energy footprint. Who can help us do that? We need to reduce our water usage. Perhaps we're not dealing with water scarcity issues in the Northeast as much, um, but we're certainly dealing with water quality issues. And how do we uh, work together and partner and who in the industry can help us that we can trust to make sure that our water is um, meeting environmental regulations, right? That I can speak in front of my, uh, constituents at a uh, council meeting and be confident that the water that they're giving to their baby or that um, they're giving to their children is safe. Um, and so in Veolia right now, my job is to oversee our Northeast region, as I mentioned. Um, we have 900 employees that service 80 municipal municipalities uh, from Boston down to Baltimore. Um, so that's our Northeast region, although we are nationwide. Um, and we deal exclusively with drinking water, wastewater, um, and stormwater. So our booth over there, we have Marnie and Chris. Um, we are absolutely hiring. We are looking for the best and brightest, and to your point about um, being looking for students who are open to challenges, looking for students who are looking to go onto the jungle gym, um, not just the straight uh, career ladder up, because in water, um, you can touch so many different functions. You touch legal, you touch finance, you touch HR, you touch customer service, you touch laboratory and science, you touch engineering, um, you touch labor. I have 50% of my workforce that is labor unions and now I am dealing with um, how do I motivate and energize folks in the field who are union employees who have been in their jobs forever um, and helping them connect to the purpose of their job, right? You often, I, I am guessing that most students who are in this room are probably going to get a job that requires a laptop. You're probably gonna get a job that has a cell phone. Um, you know, you're, you're more digitally focused. You're not going to be in the field necessarily turning valves and, and doing the work. That work is critical to do, and I will say if you have an opportunity to get into the field, even if you do have a corporate job, go into the field. Get your steel-toed shoes, get your hard hats, and show up and ask questions of the folks who've been doing this, who are in the labor unions and been doing this for years and years. They want to share their knowledge, and these people are bringing the human magic that literally is making our water flow every single day. They know this stuff, and none of it is in a book. None of it is in a computer system. It is all in their head. And when those people aren't around and there's a huge water break, guess what? We can't figure out where that valve is to shut off the water break, or to show off the water that's flowing because it's all in someone's head. And so my observation over the last few years in the water industry also is when you're joining the water industry, you have to be respectful of the different types of personalities, the different types of experience that you will inevitably encounter when you go into the field. And so when someone has been working for 30 years in the field and doesn't um, necessarily speak the same way that you do coming out of an Ivy League university, um, there's a level of respect on both sides that's critical. And so I would just caution you and, and um, guide you in when you enter any field, whether it be water, energy, waste, whatever it is, always respect the person on the other side for the experience that they bring, which will be that very different, but will teach you a lot. Um, so with that, I will say um, Veolia is a company that is looking for people who are doing both in the field work as well as corporate work. Um, and if you have a chance to go talk to Marnie and Chris, we have a lot of job openings um, for those looking for internships. Um, we do have a summer internship program, which I believe we, we piloted for the first time this past summer um, through our Paris office, and we'll be doing it again next summer. It is a certificate program, and it requires, I think, quite a bit of commitment, um, but we're happy to talk to you more about that as well, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions once we get to the Q&A period. Thanks for the opportunity to be here, and I'm so happy to have listened to my fellow panelists share their journeys. It's very inspiring to hear. Thank you so much to all of you. It has been quite inspiring to listening to your journeys uh, from your beginnings to now. And I can see a common denominator among all of you and also Angela. 
um, your entire passion to, for water, you know, and all the commitments from your companies that want to achieve that security, water security for all of us, and also the important issues, dealing with important issues such as water scarcity. So um, I'm also very pleased, and I'm sure our students are also very pleased to hear about the importance of ESGs. This is becoming now part of your fabric, right? Part of your statements. So before we turn it into, um, into the audience for questioning, I would like to ask you a few questions. So one of them would be, what innovations do you see coming in the water industry, and how will this impact job opportunities? And free data. for all. <laughs> data. <laughs> yeah, I, I could just, uh, you know, data and as well as, as the performance based control, a combination of product solutions and equipment and uh, you could say artificial intelligence or data mm -hmm. monitoring and control basically of everything. And I think that we tend to forget that the digital solutions uh, are part of the whole solution of, of water treatment, basically. Do you agree? I completely agree. I think that a lot of our infrastructure is not quite set up, and nor are the regulators set up to allow for the technology to be put, at least on the municipal drinking and wastewater side. Um, so there's quite a bit of education that has to take place um, about the, the ability to depend on these technologies that are out there producing the data and the ability to depend on the data itself. And it's something we are missing as well. And we are absolutely focus, focusing mm -hmm. on trying to solve that and, and get deeper. We've talked about that as well, Howard. Yeah, I mentioned small systems. And you know, it, it's data, but it's, it's having that technology. And um, mm -hmm. large systems have continuous monitoring. Um, they're pretty sophisticated. But um, and, and in terms of regulators, we'll have regulators still that I want an operator there seven days a week, even in there for 20 minutes. Um, and they'll prioritize that over getting in 24 hours a day monitoring that smart that can give us alarms and help us be more um, proactive. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree. Um, mm -hmm. And then just, yeah, getting, making the data information so we can make decisions quicker. Yeah, I quadrupled down on that and I joined these ladies in saying uh, it is uh, digital, or what's the word that came to mind? And, you know, something that Kendra said is very true about it's in, it's in somebody's head. Mm -hmm. And we're at an inflection point in this industry where we have a, they don't make them like they used to, you know? That the, the, something that's in somebody's head, it's not getting to the next person. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so there's an aging, there's aging infrastructure there's an aging workforce that has a lot of the knowledge and and that's not being passed on. But with the tools we have with the AI, the machine learning and mm -hmm. the digital, um, one day you're going to have the municipal water plant and you're going to have the chat GPT version to say, you know, mm -hmm. how do I change this valve or how do I shut this off? There's going to be a lot of knowledge work needed to set the, all that up and that's going to be a huge opportunity for the next generation. Thank you, thank you so much. Any, any questions from the audience? Thank you. Hi, thank y'all all for coming. Um, Ms. Morris and perhaps the rest of the panel, if y'all could answer a student who's really interested in going into the water management industry post-college, but may not have a technical degree, like engineering, yeah, College of Arts and Sciences. Um, <laughs> A lot of the panelists talked about the importance of just boots on the ground, um, getting into the field and the value of that. What are opportunities and ways that you can really get, get that experience without a technical degree? The way that I entered was business development. I would also say, you know, uh, internship, MBA, uh, starting to work, marketing can be everything, then connect to really the experts and go out in the field with them. You don't need to have a technical degree to be there and see it and understand it, and then you understand the business. We need more non-engineers. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to get in, though, as a non-engineer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, us engineers, we, we think too much. Um, 
and and we we want to keep redesigning things and we want to keep obsessing over a little thing but jokes aside um there's as much if not more opportunity in the water industry for non-technical or non-engineering talent because water is the engineering and the technology stuff's a bit it's easy we can solve that the bigger problems are policy our finance uh um getting people to change getting you know <laughs> uh, uh, managing people and uh, uh, you know we, you know I, i could go on and on about yeah. engineers but engineers need to to learn how to lead a little better you know uh, uh so there's tremendous opportunity yeah i think um, you all hit on it i i think it's it's easier i mean i had a technical path so that's the one i'm most familiar with but it certainly works some of our operations managers um did not come up through a technical path um business development was one side customer operations um is a really good way to because you'll hear from the customers what issues they're having and then it forces you to kind of understand all right what's the root cause of this and what's going on here and then um like Kendra said it doesn't matter what role you have and I I do this with our corporate leadership team we got them all going out visiting over 800 of our field offices and locations this um uh, like talk to the people that are doing the work at least for us you know we're water utility first um and so know know their jobs just here and listen to them How how important is um have mentors been for you in your careers from academia or from work any advice on that of how to develop those really important working relationships with your mentors for me they've been really important i know one of my first again consulting jobs there was a formal mentor pro- mentorship program that wasn't really very helpful um and then sometimes you have mentors and you don't realize they are a mentor till you're a little further along but um i specifically did have a a woman who is an officer which at that time there were maybe two in consulting <laughs> um there really was a glass ceiling we were talking about even hearing some students here today like i was i graduated class in 95 from umass and there were three women uh my daughter's in chemical engineering now and there's 60% women um so i'm just I think they are helpful no matter where you are at what stage but for me starting out having a woman who had broken the glass ceiling um certainly I've earned everything I had but being able to kind of help me understand how to navigate when to speak up um was really helpful and then similarly um more recently you know at um essential my boss who was chief operating officer he since retired He was really good at saying, "Colleen, in these meetings, we need to hear your voice more. Even if you agree, speak up." Um and and sometimes you need to hear that. Sometimes you think, "Oh, they have this already. Why am I going to just repeat what's already been said?" Um and so those are just small examples and then I've always been really involved and encourage you to get involved in professional organizations. Um American Water Works Association is the main one I've been in as a water uh professional. and um I've been at all levels committees divisions I'm on the water utility council now powered was once um really involved with that too and then that's where you get mentors who are in the field also passionate about what you do that you can run things off of so I I they've been really important to me yeah and and something Colleen said sticks out is that um it's never the formal mentorship it's always the informal mm-hmm. mentor men, mentoring and um <coughs> you know it's 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 fundamental um when you're coming up you need people to show you the way and and then you have to pay that back and 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 do do that uh, as well as as you grow <clears throat> i would say a, a lot of the informal mentors i agree been very important because the most important thing is that you get feedback you don't know exactly your gaps for example or how you do things or how you express yourself in a meeting and things and to get feedback and have people that you trust actually giving you inputs on how you are what you're doing and what you could do better is very important i've been blessed to have official mentors as well and i actually got the highest level in the company as a mentor and that's been extremely beneficial for me also because the challenge i've got 
every time, you know, pushing me forward. I would never sit here today without the official mentorship. And, you know, challenging me, push me, uh, you know, to do things that I was perhaps a little bit scared of to do or take more space. I'm so grateful for that today. Mm -hmm. I'd say you have to be proactive about having a mentor. You know, don't wait for someone to say, would you like me to mentor you? You know, go out and be like, he doesn't have to say like, can you be my mentor? You just go ask him questions. Hey, can I have 30 minutes of your time? I'd really like to hear, you know, how you approach this challenge or something like that. And do that often enough, not too often, you don't want to be annoying, but like, you know, do it often enough that um, it becomes a relationship that you've built. And then that person can help give you the feedback um, that's helpful and, and I think it's also important to be able to receive feedback. Um, when someone gives you feedback, you know, say thank you. <laughs> um, and then think about it. You know, you don't have to argue. You don't have to say, no, that's not true. I don't see it that way. I mean, feedback can be a gift, um, but it, it takes courage to reflect upon it. Mm -hmm. That is so true, you know, feedback. But it's, we have to receive feedback. And I, but it is hard sometimes, huh? It is. Oh, thank you so much to all our panelists. Everybody. Okay. Um, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Courtney Obregon. Yeah, we'll give you some few minutes to. Thank you so much. So again, I would like to introduce Courtney Obregon, uh, who will be leading a discussion about water tech, the startup community, and getting that first job. Um, but first, before I introduce uh, Courtney, I would like you to ask everybody to take a few minutes, just a minute, to scan the QR that is right there on the slide and take the color of water quiz. So discover your water persona, persona and learn about the role that water plays in your life by taking this less than two minute quiz. So I'm just going to give you two minutes. You're on a, on a clock and there may be prices. So go ahead. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much. I was blue, you know, so I'm good with that. Okay. So um, uh, again, um, let's talk about Kearney. All right, Kearney Fred Abregon serves as Vice President, North America Building and Infrastructure at Waving Group, where she holds a profits and loss responsibility for Waving Building and Infrastructure in North America. Courtney leads the design and implementation of the significant growth roadmap for Orbia Waving in North America. Courtney holds a BA from the University of Pennsylvania and MBA from Harvard. And let's welcome Courtney. And in addition to all that, I'm Kendra's sister <laughs> and my free time. <clears throat> um, so we have sat through a fantastic panel session, so I'm not even going to attempt to follow such a great four amazing professionals. Instead, I want to ask all of you some questions, and then I'll weave in more about Wavin and Orbia in the, the process. So it, Mostly the first question I get, it's Wavin, because it stands for water and vinyl. It was a Dutch gentleman who invented the first plastic water pipe in the Netherlands back in the 1950s. So water, vinyl, Wavin, and here we are 60 years later, still innovating. Um, but I would like to know some more about who's in the room. So can I get a raise of hands for those who are current Penn students, whether you're undergrad, grad, who are alums? who are interested by parties that thought this was going to be a really cool event. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so we have a good mix of people. And also, I'm curious, well, Wavin and Orbia are, is a global company. I mean, we're a multinational $10 billion corporation. Wavin's about $3 billion of that. It's our largest business group in the, the company. And we're around the world. So who here is uh, from outside of the United States? Yeah, a good group of people. I'm going to then assume the rest are you from, from the United States. Yeah, okay, just checking. Um, so two seconds about Wavin and, and Orbia, because we are hiring too. 
and um, Orbia is a conglomerate of three different raw material businesses and three plastic uh, extrusion businesses. So we, we take raw materials and then we have the other side of the business that does something with the raw materials. I'm on the does something with the raw material side. And I, unlike the panelists we've heard from, I am not a long time water. I met Howard last year. I don't have any Howard stories, but I will in the future. And um, I came from a business side. So I'm, um, I'm the mile wide and an inch deep sort of a person. I was, I'm a general manager by training. I was at Dow Chemical for 15 years. Maersk, the Danish shipping company before that, before I got my uh, MBA and uh, now at Orbia for a year and a half. And we are doing a startup in North America. So Orbia is a big company, Wavin's a big company. Wavin's been around for 60 years, but they've never come to the US for various historic reasons. I can explain over a drink, it has to do with legal issues. And um, they decided a couple years ago, this was the biggest market in the world and they should be here. So I was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time and got asked to lead the, the startup of a North America business inside of a big multinational company, which is a pretty cool experience. So we did an acquisition in Canada and we are on the hardware side. Like I mentioned, we do stuff with plastics. And so we uh, make plastic pipes, plastic fittings, and infiltration units, green blue roofs, tree tanks, all sort of different water management technology. And just as you heard in the panel, we're also going into data because that's where the future value is going to be. A lot of hardware is a commodity. It, that's what it is. We innovate around how you connect, how fast that you can put things together, how do you ship it so it's more economical and you're not shipping as much air. But in the end of the day, you're shipping a plastic pipe. That is, it's a very good quality pipe and it has a very good purpose in life, but it's very, very similar to the next plastic pipe because we're under a regulatory industry and everybody has to hit the same pressure standards, the same manufacturing standards and ISO. So it's, that's not where you're, you're going to make your differentiation. That's not where you're going to make your premium on your profit, which is coming from the business side. That's the, the part I get measured on every month is how do all did you do on your bottom line? So from a Wabin standpoint and an Orbia, we, we're constantly looking at what kind of problems can we solve because we, water tech is an area that's not very well developed or funded when uh, the UN had their water conference earlier this year. There was a lot of talk about how much capital goes into carbon. Panel talked about that, how much capital goes into water. Not quite as much and not even close actually. It's, you know, billions of dollars on the carbon side and hundreds of millions on the, the water side, if that. So I was curious and I'll walk around if anybody has, wants to raise their hand and talk, but what, what do all of you see as the biggest water challenge that you want to solve in the industry. Hi, I'm Thomas. Um, I'm a pen alum and very interested in waters. So, Courtney, too, my, my thought is that it's a communication uh, challenge because, as you mentioned, so much money and attention has gone into carbon but in the broader public, and I feel the broader public is starting to understand climate change, biodiversity loss, but people take water for granted too much and they're not investing enough into water and there's a lot of investor dollars that should be put into water. Agreed, water, you can't live without water, but yet it's not valued. And if you can't value something, it's really hard to get a return on it which is one of the biggest problems, I think, that the finance, the UN Water Conference turn, talked a lot about the financing aspect of water because you can't value it, you can't get funding, and it becomes a subsidy or something else. So we have to find ways to value water in different ways. Anybody else, biggest concerns you have for water, what, why you're going into the field, what made you want to study it to solve a problem? I met some great grad students. Hello. Hi, good to meet you in Hi. person. Um, I would say I've heard at these sort of big events like UN, etc., that the way we're going to experience and feel the worst of climate change is through water, droughts, flooding, etc. So I think the intersection between sort of trying to make our cities, communities um, more resilient 
to cope with this, I think is very interesting. And maybe some investment is going to start shifting into their cli new climate tech type opportunities. Thank you, Karen. Karen is a, a fantastic water expert and has a consulting business. If anybody's looking for some help on research, market, technology, go talk to Karen. Um, I definitely agree. Climate resiliency, I have a Google alert on all sorts of different stormwater management, climate resilience, and it's, it's like 30 or 40 every time I get my weekly review. So much, so many townships and cities are trying to address the flooding in their areas. And I personally, when you're trying to sell products that solve some of these challenges and you have to go municipality and township by township across the entire United States, we, we don't have enough money to hire that many salespeople. Uh, we, it just is not profit. So you end up, and then you have the federal government on one side that has money available to replace lead pipes, to help do funding, to do um, studies on watersheds. I lived in Houston for a decade, and let me tell you, if it rained a little bit, you had to be careful not to drive under some bridges because you might not come out the other side. So you, you, and you just, so the, the cities are really focused on this and they need to solve the problems. So climate resiliency absolutely, I think, is a, a huge topic that people are now paying attention to and money is coming behind. It's a good place to be. Oh, yeah, you can go through. Oh, this is Griffin. Yeah, I'm Griffin. Um, just to add on to that, I think climate resiliency, but also working with nature to create more sustainable cities. Right now I'm working on a project researching the Atchafalaya River and the old control um, station and how the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers since like the 1920s have basically been waging war against the Mississippi River. And as we know, like it's a losing battle against nature. So how do we design systems that actually embrace the change that our world is going to come to through and, um, you know, create more sustainable systems out of it? Yes, I agree. And the biodiversity topic is also extremely relevant in conversations about stormwater management. And, and a shout out to um, Bentley works with Lankanal uh, High School, which is a STEM scientific, I'm gonna get the name wrong, Brenton, help me out here. It's an uh, yes. science yes. environment, yes. but focus on environmental science. Yes. Yeah, that's it. And so they're looking at some of those things. That was the point of that. So if you're interested, check out the Lankanal uh, High School project there too which Joe is also involved with. There we go, I have a Howard story. <laughs> Anybody else wanna share? And then we'll, we'll wrap up so we can have our closing speaker. Yeah, oh, you're right, coming right behind you. This is Gabriella. Hi, I'm Gabriella. I actually don't go here. I go to St. Joseph's University, so not too far away. I'm a marketing major, so I'm here because I know Joanne, um, she's a family friend. And I'm just curious, I'm here, I don't know anything about water, I'm completely honest, but at St. Joe's I work a lot in campus ministry and we do a lot of social justice advocacy work. Um, so I'm interested in how issues of water intertwine with other, like in the intersectionality of water with different issues such as you know, food insecurity and um, migration and stuff like that. Yep, and you should look up the uh, World Economic Forum and Uplink because they have an enormous focus on food water security it's a like a um, venn diagram of different interests and they they put a lot of effort into that that topic exactly but we love marketing people because you have to sell these things if you're going to earn money <laughs> so and money is the way that you can then invest in more technologies and more developments and that's i mean that's essentially what we we do every day is try to find a way to bring innovations and great ways of doing things I me mean, specifically to the u.s from a history in europe and latin america but I will thank you all very much for your participation in this part of the event. It's great to meet all of you and best of luck. Come by and see all of us at the tables and at the, the networking afterward. Thank you, Kearney, for all your inspiring discussion. And um, so now I'd like to turn it over to our final speaker of the event, our closing keynote, Keisha Powell. Uh, Keisha Powell, she's General Manager, CEO of WSSC Water, is a dynamic force in the global water sector with 24 years of experience in both the public and private sectors across the U.S. and also in London, England. Keisha, 
Grisha, um, Kisha leads a team of over 1,600 people and manages the day-to-day -day operations of the largest water utility in Maryland and ensures that water and water resource recovery services are safely provided to 1.9 million customers. A licensed professional engineer in Maryland, Virginia, and the District of Columbia, Kisha holds a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from Morgan State University's Clarence M. M, M. Mitchell Junior School of Engineering. Let's welcome Kisha Powell to the stage. Thank you, Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, thank you to University of Pennsylvania for the inv invitation to provide remarks at this year's uh, career day. I also want to thank and acknowledge the Water Center for your leadership in addressing the sector's many challenges and your tireless efforts to accelerate water equity. I recall during the pandemic, um, I, was, I had an opportunity to be on a panel uh, on water affordability um, with, the, with the Water Center. And so that's a topic that is always uh, really top of mind for me especially now as we're advocating for a budget that allows for investment in our critical infrastructure and our team members who are truly our most important assets. And um, I actually have a Howard story, I have a few Howard stories, <laughs> but uh, I only have 10 minutes and my communications team uh, wrote um, 30 minutes of remarks. So <laughs> I will <laughs> spare you the Howard story. Um, but Again, our, our team members are our most valued assets, um, like Ayana Castro, who is here, and um, I, from our HR team. And I'm sure uh, she has told you all about WSSC Water today if you had a chance to visit the table. If not, we'll talk about it more during the networking session. Um, but um, not only are we the largest water wastewater utility in the state of Maryland, we're the eighth largest in the country out of 55,000 uh, water wastewater utilities. And um, as of January, we became a member of the Global Water Network. Hi, Travis. I didn't see you back there. Um, it is, you know, being a, a leading utility, um, that was an accomplishment for us. It came as a result of many different innovations. Um, and, and thought leadership through our utility, which was not just by engineers. It, it really takes a village of, of thought leaders um, to continue to progress. Um, but in my mind, there's one thing that makes us special, and it's our people. Does anyone know what last week, or was it, yeah, last week I'm using track of time, October 19th was? Hazard it. You probably know this. Yes, imagine a day without water. I was afraid no one would know because then I would have had to pivot in my remarks. <laughs> That's right. Imagine a day without water. It's a national day to highlight how essential water is to our daily lives and to underscore the need to increase funding for the water sector. And I'll touch on funding in a few moments. But in recognition of Imagine a Day Without Water, we put together a short video to honor WSSC Water employees this year, better known as Team H2O. They work tirelessly 24 seven to ensure we are providing safe and reliable water to our customers and expertly treating wastewater and providing excellent service to, to all internally and externally. So let's take a look. This is our passion. We are WSSC Water, always on the job. Our frontline heroes, delivering essential drinking and wastewater services to you and your family. This is our One Water mission for you, our 1.9 million customers. Our track record is impressive. Over a century of service without a single drinking water quality violation. Our dedicated employees always protecting public health, safety, and the environment. 
We are Team H2O, and we are always on the job, ready to serve you. I think this is my 10th time watching this video and it really gets me every time. And what is most special in that video is seeing the diversity and the inclusion. And Maya, who has her glamour shot in front of the window, um, she's an engineer, but she came back to us. We call her one of our boomerangs um, because people are drawn to the culture that we're creating within the organization. Um, but it's not just about the diversity that you can see. It's also about the diversity you can't see. And what I love about Team H2O is that we are a collection of people um, that have different cultures, different backgrounds. We come from different walks of life, different countries, uh, different educational backgrounds. We hire those that uh, don't have a high school diploma up to those that have master's and PhD degrees. Um, and together we are a collection of people now Team H2O, that are working to serve um, and do the greater good for the communities that we serve. Um, and that takes uh, diverse thought leadership. Um, we shared this video with our customers across our social media platforms, which I believe enabled them to gain a greater understanding and appreciation of our commitment to ensure that they never have to imagine a day without water. But given the shared challenges that water utilities across the country face, many people know what it's like to experience a day without water. And I actually had a chance. This is the fifth utility that I've been with. I've been the chief operating officer at one, um, the principal in charge of the four others, including uh, the water wastewater utilities that serve Jackson, Mississippi. And I can tell you that when I was there, it was tough because we didn't have, it came down to people. And um, it's very difficult to run a utility when you don't have the people that you need because pipes and plants don't run themselves, pipes don't fix themselves. Um, if you can't manage the money well, if you are not communicating well with the, with the community and the stakeholders, then it's, it's challenging. Um, and then years later to see uh, where the community ended um, or, or landed not having um, the leadership and the funding that it needed to address the infrastructure was really heartbreaking. And I think all of us in the water sector feel that every time we see a failure of, of that magnitude or challenges of that magnitude. But I wanna back up for a moment and comment on uh, what a breathtaking facility this is. And now this is planned in the remarks, but it really is a uh, breathtaking that they knew that I would be very impressed with this. Um, because uh, when I enter rooms like this, I think about what I actually had a passion for. It really wasn't civil engineering. Um, I actually wanted to be an interior designer. I never intended to be an engineer. And in fact, I went through a list of career choices and I, I ruled them out one by one. I wanted to be a stewardess at one time. I'm afraid of heights, that didn't work. Um, I wanted to be a lawyer and then my mom and I were watching a movie and the movie was about a lawyer that was lying for their client and I didn't agree with that. Um, but you have to provide a rigorous defense, I understand that. Um, and so, she told me, um, and I had talked about being an interior for several years, very good in art, had planned to go to RISD, Rhode Island Institute of Design. And my mom told me, you already know how to change your room around, pick something else. <laughs> what? <laughs> so I went to school one day and uh, we had an electrical engineer, woman electrical engineer coming from NASA. And uh, she inspired me so much that I went home that day and I said, I found it. I want to be an engineer. I was really so blown away with it. And then it just became, I was obsessed with it. So for my 12th grade uh, science project, I actually built um, a, a, a digital clock using a 555 timer on a breadboard with a quartz crystal 
And it actually worked. I know it worked. Um, but I was really, really absorbed. I went to graduate, went to Syracuse University, um, and I was truly, truly all in. Um, and I ended up transferring from Syracuse to Morgan State University. I did not take my studies as seriously as I was passionate about engineering and figured I would go to Morgan, get my grades up, and then go back to Syracuse. But I really found my village at Morgan State University back home in Baltimore. I went in my um, advisor's office and he had a picture of, of Frank Lloyd Wright's falling water on the wall. And um, you may know he's an architect. And um, after expressing my interest in architecture, my advisor said, well, we don't have that here, so pick civil engineering. It's the same thing. It really is not. <laughs> but again, as someone who was afraid of heights, building bridges wasn't my thing, so that part of civil engineering wasn't going to work. So I signed up for different internships. I actually did one at State Highway Administration. I'm glad I didn't go into transportation. I think water is better, even though transportation gets more money. Um, and I started to choose uh, internships in the water space, or, or they chose me. I actually interned for the Critical Area Commission in Annapolis, um, which is really where I fell in love with the water on the Chesapeake Bay. Um, I love to sail. Annapolis is my favorite place on earth of all of the places that I have been. And I also did an internship during school with the city of Baltimore's Bureau of Water and Wastewater. And um, I realized that there will always be challenges in water as I thought about it more toward graduation and what I wanted to do. I knew that I absolutely wanted to be in the water sector because after all, when will we never need safe, clean drinking water? Even if people are buying bottled water, we still need safe, clean drinking water. And we also need to recover resources from, from wastewater. So that's how I got into the business. And I can tell you, I have been blessed, absolutely blessed with the many opportunities that I could never have imagined as a young girl. And in fact, Kendra, I grew up in East Baltimore, two blocks away from where the wire was shot. And it was about the West Side drug trade, but the East Side drug trade was just as treacherous. And for a time, Baltimore was one of those places that I was actually scared to go because I recognized what was happening firsthand. But now I claim that as my city and my place where I was born, raised and educated. Um, but I, in this moment and so many others, as I've traveled the world, um, be going on a water tour look, uh, across Europe for uh, seven days to looking at resilience in Rotterdam, wherever, uh, Cape Town, South Africa, as they were approaching day zero, um, I know that this is the career that I was meant to be in. And at the end of the day, um, I am still an engineer at my core. Um, but right out of university, I had gone into consulting, um, doing wet weather program management, design work. Um, and in fact, my first design job, I was hiding in my cube with an engineering pad. Because if you're an engineer, you have to have that little quad pad. And it just made, I, you get another one because one is not enough and a mechanical pencil. And I was literally trying to draw a belt filter press when my boss came by and said, and that's something that dewaters uh, sludge or the, the, the solid matter from wastewater. And uh, my boss said, well, what are you trying to do? And I said, I'm designing a belt filter press. He said, no, you don't do it that way. You go to the last set of engineering uh, drawings, the last design, and just pull that off the shelf and put a pipe here, a pipe there, and just draw a box on where the belt filter press will sit. Well, we didn't learn that in school. Um, but anyway, um, it was truly a full circle moment for me um, after being a consultant, living and working in London for almost a year, to come back to the city of Baltimore and start my public sector career, where I was appointed by Mayor Dixon. 
And um, I can tell you that at that time, um, I was literally drinking from a fire hose. The probably, well, I know I was the youngest on our senior executive team, uh, managing people who had managed me when I was an intern. Um, but I, I knew that at that moment, I was the intersection of my education and my lived experience was going to help me move forward in my career. And so it was through my first utility management experience that I was exposed to all the possibilities that a career in water has. It's operations, program management, law, engineering, information technology, communications, innovation, water quality, utility management, industrial discharge. Have I touched everybody in the room yet? Um, we even have policy, safety, uh, supplier diversity, and of course my favorite, politics, which everyone who knows me knows that's, that's not true, um, and interior design. In fact, one of the folks that I enjoy working with the most is one of our young professionals, and she's in interior design, and I live vicariously through her. Um, so though I was fake mad at my mom for turning my attention away from interior design, I really am truly exactly where I was meant to be. Now, I've got tons of um, uh, stats and data, because that's what communications folks write for engineers, but I'm not going to bore you with that. I'm just going to say, and I heard listening in the back some of the conversation about the challenges what I would say the most significant challenge we're facing in the water sector right now is affordability. Um, we need to do more. We need to invest more to be reliable and resilient, but it's difficult when we're serving communities. And I serve two of the most affluent counties in the country, but we still have pockets of disadvantaged, underserved communities that have significant challenges paying their water and sewer bills, um, and we as a utility have affordability concerns. So as we think about affordability, we have to think about the least of these, those that um, are truly vulnerable to the rising costs of inflation. Um, we have to raise rates because the trend in consumption is going down, not up, um, and we have to recover that revenue. And um, it really makes it challenging when I have to, with a straight face, ask for a double digit rate increase, knowing that there will be people who will be pinched. And so we have to figure out how do we balance those needs, hold them in tension when we're not getting the funding from the federal government, which is why we continue to advocate and also why it's important to make sure that we have more lived experience and more people that think differently as part of our team to help us figure this out. Uh, recently, and I heard the question that you asked, um, we did an assessment for our senior leadership team um, called the HBDI, the Herman Brain Dominance Indicator Test. And um, many of us in the room were more blue thinkers, data driven. Uh, when we are under pressure, we think more green, organizing, figure out how to uh, address the problem but not really resolve the problem. But it, I was happy to see we had a lot of yellow, more visionaries. We had a lot of red, people-centered folks on the team. And we are working to make sure that we grow in those areas. And when we did a composite, of how we all think, and the, the, the purpose of the, the assessment is to see how we think together as a team. Um, we had a whole brain in the room, fortunately, and we were balanced, which is a great thing as a leadership team. So um, I say that to say that wherever, whatever your walk is now, definitely, I think what you've heard from all the speakers today is that you can find a place, you have a place in the water sector, you should, we want you to come. And I don't think I've said it enough, but we are hiring too. And I am the general manager CEO, so I can hire you on the spot. <laughs> 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 
And we, we are working toward competitive wages. We want to be the most well compensated, and Ayana can vouch for this. We put it in writing in our transition report, which is online. Um, we want to be the, the most well compensated and the strongest water team in the water sector. And we are on our way, absolutely on our way. And that is public and private utilities. Um, so, but we all work together and support one another. We're not competitive at all. Um, <laughs> um, definitely, you have a place in the water sector. What our motto is, um, we have a campaign running um, to attract folks that are interested in, in joining our team, definitely looking at the water sector. We call, call it Pursue Your Passion. And if you look at LinkedIn, at our website, if you look at, uh, or the website, you look at our LinkedIn page, our social media, Instagram, um, X or Twitter, whatever it is, um, you'll see videos from our team members that talk about why they are pursuing their passion at WSSC Water. So I would leave you um, with a few bits of advice. And that is to definitely hone in, understand what, you, what drives you, what you're interested in. Let that be your guide um, in terms of, of uh, motivating you or, or moving you in a direction of what you will do. Focus on having a career, not just having a job. Because when you focus on the short term, um, then you are limiting yourself in terms of what you can do Always think that you can do more than you're doing at the current time and challenge yourself. Put yourself in uncomfortable situations um, because that is what allows you to grow. And don't look for the swing at the fence, the big opportunities. I never set out to be a general manager. Now I've been one four times. And every time I sign up for the job, I kick myself. And Howard knows, is, you, know, you don't want this. Um, <laughs> um, but I do it because I get to create a space and a culture where people can thrive. I get to work with the team to make sure that we have um, an environment where people can excel and do their best. Um, and I do this because I know that there are people that we are serving that need someone to see them, that need someone to understand that at the end of the day, we have to balance the things that we need to do to make sure that we're providing the best service to them. And I invite you to come and join us at WSSC Water because I can tell you it is the best place to be in the water sector. Thank you. I think I'm supposed to take questions. Okay. Okay, so questions. Did you have a question? Oh. No? Oh, okay. Um, hello? Hello? Uh, thank you for your talk today. Um, and I was just wondering, regarding the rate increases that you have to do, how are you going out into communities and how are you engaging them and talking with them about how this could, how the how a twelve percent increase or how a double digit increase mm -hmm. could impact them, and what what their lives would be like when trying to navigate that? Yeah, great question because we're behind, and um, but I did get a presentation this morning for town halls that we're planning. Um, so a combination of things. A couple of weeks ago, the team did some grassroots community walks. Um, going door to door and um, setting up a table going forward. We're going to do pop-up events to make sure that folks have an opportunity to ask questions about the need, um, but to also make sure that we truly understand. We have been visiting those, um, based on the data that we have, those communities that uh, where there is a concentration of folks that are having difficulty paying their bills. And um, what we believe is that, and I think about affordability as a three-legged stool. 
um, making sure we have external funding, uh, making sure that we have customer assistance programs to help those that need it. Um, but then we also have to make sure that we have affordable rates, but they also have to be adequate. And part of the equation as well is connecting people with the jobs that we have. Um, folks that are having affordability challenges, many in many cases, they're underemployed. And we have great low barrier to entry jobs, um, but we have, I mean, we have so many vacancies. I think we have 200 some vacancies at this point. Um, so there are opportunities for, for literally any and everyone um, that is willing to work hard and be part of the solution. So trying to not only connect um, folks in the community with customer assistance dollars that we have available, but also using that as an opportunity to, to connect them with jobs. Um, we just, uh, yesterday I wrote a letter to um, all of the, the pastors and leaders of, of congregations in our service area to ask them to help us reach um, members of their congregations, our customers, and then we'll be doing town hall meetings as well. Um, because again, we believe we have to meet people where they are. Um, we're also, uh, we'll be partnering with schools because we know that young ones go home and tell their parents things and their parents listen um, at, at a certain age. And <laughs> um, in fact, my, my, my nephew moved in with me. I don't listen to him as much as I listen to his one-year-old son. Um, so we want to make sure that, again, we are meeting folks where they are. And that is why it's so important. I think someone said this earlier. We need less engineers and more people people because we have, we're, what we do is about service at the end of the day. It's very technical, complex systems that we manage. But at the end of the day, we're serving people. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much. Again, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you again, Kisha, for such an inspiring presentation. Um, so thank you again to all our presenters. And again, thank you to all of the sponsors who made this event possible. Bentley Systems, Aquatech, Aqua, American Water, Arcadis, Selenis, Bialia, Wavin, WSSC Water, the Penn Career Services, MBA Career Services, Penn Environmental Innovation Initiative, Penn Center for Science, Sustainability, and the Media, and the Annenberg Public Policy Center. Thank you for all of you for coming out today as well. And uh, I don't have a sustaining a power story, but I will have to say that my story with Howard has begun and is never going to end. Uh, I have to say, all my students, uh, I love it. When they walk in my office and like, oh, I'm interested in water, then it's like no brainer. Go and see Howard. And the best part of it, that I always check on that, right? I always, how was the conversation with Howard? And I have to say that they become inspired. They love to hear from Howard. So Howard, thank you so much for being a wonderful mentor. <laughs> so I also want to thank all the team from the Water Center for putting this wonderful uh, career event together. And I also want to acknowledge Brenton McCluskey from the Water Center. Yeah. Emma Dennison, right there. And my dear friend and colleague, Joanne Spinogardo. So, so now I think we have the network opportunity. Uh, we have heard from WSSC Water. The pressure is on, so let's get to the tables. Thank you so much.